Hallelujah. God is good. It reads just like this. Exodus chapter 14. Track with me. Chapter 14, beginning at verse 15. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move forward. The Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Then the angel of the Lord, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. Then the angel of the Lord, who had been traveling in front of Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. The pillar of cloud also moved in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the side, to one side, and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. Do me a favor and just tell your neighbors, move forward. Come on, tell them, move forward. Now you got to tell them like they in your way. Move, move, move forward. Move, you, brother, you got to talk to people. Huh? Come on, move forward. Don't be scared. They're nice. Amen. Amen. Move forward. Huh? I remember well it was the entertainment center of its day. It's set in our living room, and in the center, there was a TV. On one left side, there was a radio. On the right side, <clears throat> there was a record player. I remember my brother learned at some point that he could take my father's records, and he could be a DJ and scratch records. I also learned that I could play the records at different speeds and make anybody sound like Mickey Mouse. My father subsequently learned that many, many of his LPs no longer work correctly. In a very real sense, our life is something like that. Our life is like a record. With every groove, it's designed to move us closer to God. Day by day, groove by groove, it's spinning forward moving us to God. However, just like in my home, there are those who would scratch the record of our life. And one scratch, one scratch can damage our whole life. It might be a scratch that seems small and insignificant early on in your childhood. Maybe someone hurt you or mistreated you. Maybe someone neglected you or left you. And that small scratch has had your life skip Skip, 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 skipping over and over, making a marred sound. Maybe it happened in your midlife. Maybe the company that you worked for, you were fruitful and faithful. Maybe they decided that they no longer needed you. and You were downsized, you were cut, and then when they filed bankruptcy, your benefits were gone. Maybe it happened toward the end of your life. Maybe you were a wonderful parent, you were giving, and forgiving, but the child and children that were to take care of you have suddenly become stingy and forgetful. They don't check on you, care about you, or help you. Well, whatever, at whatever point in the record of your life that the scratch or the scar has happened, this record in our text is tailored to teach us that God, let me make it plain, I, I remember one time we scratched one of my father's records. Now, some of y'all young, you may not know what a record is. When we scratched this particular album, my father was very disappointed. Uh, but at some point, he walked over to the record player and took the record that has been scratched, and he said, now the A side is scratched, but I'm going to play the B side of this record. The truth is, God can turn your life over and give you a new start. Where you were marred and skip, skip, skipping, God says, hey, I know it's been messed up. I know it's been jacked up. I know the scar is so deep and so bad, but I can 
turn things over. And God says the second side of your life will be better than the first side of your life. So if you feel me, then you understand that this record is here to teach us. Moses in this story and God's people in this testimony are here to teach us that God says you can move forward regardless of what you've been through. Now, I don't know what you've been through, but I saw it on your face when I was talking about the scratches and the scars. I've come by to tell you don't think on it too long because God said it's time to move forward. Whatever it is, wherever you are, however bad it hurt, I'm not minimizing. I'm just saying that God says to move forward. That's the testimony and the record of this text. Look at the text with me. You see, on last week, we discovered that the people of Israel, God's people, a people named, rescued, and redeemed, were now in a situation where they looked trapped. Would you say that? Trapped. But the truth is, it was not a trap. It was not a trap for their enemy, but it was a refuge from for God. God had put them in a safe place, and he had protected them. And why they are there, people begin to grumble, and people begin to complain, people begin to fret, and people begin to fight. But God showed up just in the nick of time. And God, this is the first point, gives a message, a mandatory message to Moses. And God says, tell the people, move forward. Tell the people, stop getting stuck. Tell the people stop staying there. Tell the people stop looking back, stop going back. Move forward. God is declaring that we are called to move from where we were to move to where he wants us to be. God is declaring that our past is smaller than our future, so we've got to move forward. Can I show it to you in the text? The text is tailored to teach us to move forward. Now, last week, I did not mention one of the key themes. I did not mention the cloud. The cloud, or the angel of the Lord, but which represents Christ or God, the, the cloud was not mentioned in the preceding uh, verses. But here it's mentioned, but it's mentioned in a strange kind of way. For the first time, stay with me, for the first time, the cloud is not in front of them. The stay cloud is not over them, but the cloud moves to behind them. What not that strange that God would move behind his people? Isn't that strange? But look, we see that God was setting up a wall between their past and their future. And I've come by to let you know that wherever you are, God says, I'll take care of your past. You look forward. I, I'll take care of your enemies who are chasing after you. You move forward. I, I'll take care of whatever is behind you, but whatever you did, whatever they did, whatever happened, I'll take care of it. No, you look forward, baby. Don't look back. Look, look, look forward. Okay. Y'all not feeling me. This is going to help some drivers. Uh, when I was growing up, I remember learning to drive. I remember learning to drive and my, uh, learning to uh, ride a bicycle, and my father was helping me. And day after day, he would help me ride this bicycle. But I was rem remember, at one point, I had gotten to the point that we believed I could ride, and so my brother helped me on the bike. My, my daddy stood out uh, in the distance, and I started riding to my daddy. I was wobbling. I was shaking, but I was moving forward, y'all. But here's what happened. I, I wanted to show my brother that I could move forward. So while I was riding my bike forward, I look backwards, and in looking backwards, I, I turn the, the steering, I turn the handlebars back and the bike lock and I flew off the bike. You see, it's dangerous when we make a habit of looking back. It, it's dangerous when we're driving forward and all the while looking back. That, that's why the, the rear view mirror in our automobiles, in our cars are so very small. They're so small because God, hey, wants us to look forward. He does not want us to be fixated on our past. He does not want us to look back all the time. We can learn from it, but we are to look and focus forward. This is so much the case that when you look, when you look at, at what happens behind them, even at the point, even at the point that they begin to cross over into the Red Sea, God allows them to see the destruction of their enemy. Because God wanted them to see that not only are they behind you, but they can no longer chase after you. Not only is the mistake you made behind you, but you can no longer be held hostage by it. It is destroyed. God has taken care of it. It's done. The truth is, so many of us get stuck looking back, and we find ourselves falling forward because we're looking back. The only way you can be what God wants you to be, and you can 
do what God wants to do is to decide that I'm going to look forward, that I'm not stuck in my past. Yes, I did it. Yes, it was me. Yes, it was a mess. And yes, it was a mistake. Yes, that's my baby. Uh, yes, that's my, yes, uh, yeah, I said it. Yes, but I'm still moving forward. Yes, my credit might be jacked up. Yes, my heart might be hurt, but I'm still moving forward. Yes, I have it on my record. Yes, it's a criminal record. Yes, they call it a felony and some call me a felony. But yes, I'm moving forward that your past is not greater than your future. And I know a few of you are in here thinking, well, I don't have anything in my past. And I just want to let you know, you've been lying uh, even in your past because you can move forward despite your past. This is a mandate. God says you must move forward. God says you cannot stay stuck there. Somebody said is the seven last words of the church is we've always done it that way. No, no, no. You must move forward. Stop mentioning all the stuff that happened in your past. Stop fixating and focusing on what they did to hurt you. Yes, it hurt. And yes, there is a scratch and even a scar. But God says you've got to move forward. The next time the devil starts reminding you what happened and how bad it was, just tell him, nah, shut up, I'm moving forward. Nah, be quiet, I I'm moving forward. Nah, we didn't handle it the right way last time, but we're going to do it the right way this time. We are moving forward. That's, that's, that's the, he says, he starts off the text. Tell them, stop, stop fretting Moses, and tell them, he gives this a, a mandate, move forward. But then the next thing in the text, and I know this is going to help you because I see the look on your face. Uh, the problem is, well, Rev, how do I move forward when it hurts so bad? How do I move forward when it seems so hard? Well, the next thing this text is tailored to teach us not only the mandate to move forward, but look, but look, God is miraculous. Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the, text, the text is tailored to teach us that God is miraculous, that, that God does great things that God goes against nature and does the unnatural. You missed that. That God does the unexpected and the improbable and the unlikely. Woo! That God still does miracles. Oh, I know the problem. You see, a lot of us believe, we believe in miracles as long as they're in the King James Bible. Oh yeah, we believe in Daniel and the lion dude. We believe in Jonah and the whale. We even believe that Jesus got up with all power in his hand. But when it comes to your life, when it comes to your circumstances, when it comes to where you are, we don't believe in miracles. No, no, no it's done. No, no, I'm sick. No, no, the doctor said. No, no, the attorney said. No, no, the psychologist or the counselor said. No, no. I believe in miracles. And I want to challenge you. If you can believe the most complex, the most dynamic, the most difficult miracle in all the Bible, and this is that the Savior of the world was born in Bethlehem, the baby boy born in Bethlehem, lived 33 years, and then died a cruel and heartless death, then you better believe that if God can resurrect him, that he can resurrect any circumstance. If you believe in the miracle of Jesus Christ, then you better believe in the miracle of your credit getting straight. Then you better believe in the miracle of your marriage getting right. Then you better believe in the miracle of your depression passing over. Then you better believe in the miracle of your unemployment change. Then you better be, believe in the miracle that because you were a crook and you were a shyster and you were a thug back then, you can be heavenly and holy right now. You can believe and you better believe in miracles. Uh, 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 okay. Uh. Deuteronomy 29, Deuteronomy 29, beginning at verse 4, Deuteronomy, you can write that down, Deuteronomy 29, beginning at verse 4, gives a resume, a dossier, and a CV of some of the miracles that God did for the people while they were traveling in the wilderness. For 40 years, they were traveling in the wilderness. And God, through Moses, delineates some of the things that God did. It starts off by saying, this is Deuteronomy 29, beginning at verse 4. It says, For 40 years I guided you, I guided you for the wilderness, and one of the miracles is it says, and your shoes never wore out. Y'all have some nice shoes, but I do suspect that most of your shoes are not 40 years old. 
Now, there may be some exceptions, but keep in mind, they were walking in the wilderness, and they had one pair of shoes. For 40 years, the natural and nature's decay and degradation or breakdown did not happen to their shoes for 40 years. Second miracle. Not only did the natural breakdown not happen to their shoes, uh, uh, but, but I guess their clothes was from uh, Forever 21 because their clothes for uh, 40 years did not wear out. Now, they may have went out of style, I don't know, but for 40 years, they wore the same clothes. For 40 years, God said, the clothes that you have on your back will not wear, but I'll take care. You missed that. They will not wear, but I'll take care of you. For 40 years, God said, I got you, baby Baba. I, I got you, baby Boo. I, I got you taken care of. It. Your shoes are good. You know, when a man loves a woman, he buys us some shoes and some clothes. I'm not trying to cause no trouble. Uh, uh, and so God said, hey, Israel, I love you. I got your shoes. I got your clothes. And then look, for 40 years, that particular text, Deuteronomy 29 says, and they did not bake bread. <laughs> they did not, for 40 years, bake bread. Now there's a lot in there, but, but what he's referring to is manna. That God, for 40 years, made sure they had perfect nutrition in wonderful food. You could call it heavenly cornbread. I mean, God provided this cornbread that was so good, make you want to kiss your mama. I mean, God said for 40 years here every morning, and look, it was so perfect and so heavenly that look, uh, God said, I will give it to you fresh every day, except for on Saturday, you better get it on Friday, and if you try to get extra, it will decay. God, that's, that's miracle, miracle number three. But then it goes on the same text to say, and for 40 years, they did not drink wine. Well, what does that mean? Well, they, they did not drink wine has nothing to do with sobriety. It, it has everything to do with God's supply. Because typically, when you were passing through the desert, you would often take wine because wine could last in the heat, in, in, in the climate, and in the temperatures of the desert. And so what you did, you, you, you carried wine because it would last. But God said, even though you are in the desert, I will give you daily water. God says, even in the desert, if I have to use a rock, God has a sense of humor. God used a rock and turned a rock into spring water. God put a tap on a rock and they were drinking from a rock. All I'm trying to say is miracle after, okay, Yana, feel me. Uh, you can go to Deuteronomy chapter 7. Deuteronomy chapter 7 says, for 40 years, they did not need a doctor. For 40 years, while they were in the desert, God said, I'm going to keep you healthy. I'm going to keep you strong. I'm going to keep you going. All I'm trying to say is, okay, I, I see the problem. The problem is you're saying, well, those miracles happened to them, but they're not happening to me. But you have to understand how God works. You have to understand... God, thank you. You have to understand that God gives grace for the journey. God gives grace for the journey. So your journey does not require my grace. You, you couldn't handle five kids. I, I can barely handle them too. But, uh, or, or, you may, or, or, or I couldn't handle managing 150,000 employees. But, but see, God says, I'm going to give you what you need for you. And, and this is the third and final point, you see. Because not only is God miraculous, check this out. God is meticulous. God is meticulous. That word comes from the Latin, which means we would say fearful. But that's not the best translation because when we're talking about God and fear, it's not the same kind of fear that we think about. That means reverence. And so God has a sense of reverence to every detail in your life. God knows everything that's happening, all the circumstances. Okay, uh, his name is Eric Finney. This week in the Washington Post, Eric Finney tells how he was swimming in Huntington, California, off the beach. And he had his daughter with him. He was holding her and swimming off the beach. The waves were crashing. It was a wonderful day. All of a sudden, he felt something happen to his back. He felt a sharp and harsh pain in his back. The pain was so great, he could only think to squeeze his daughter close and swim fast to the beach. When he, when he got to the doctor, the, the doctors began to operate on him. But as they operated on Mr. Finney, they noticed something. They said, look, we were operating on a small 
cut in your back that had to have been from a large shark. We don't want to say it attacked you. It must have ran into you. But while we were operating on you, we noticed that something is going on with your liver. On your liver, we discovered there is some malignant ca cancer. And we would not have discovered this but for the shark that you ran to, into and the shark that ran into you. And look, the cancer is so fast growing, we're glad we discovered it now because you surely would have died rather soon because of this cancer. And so they operated on his back and they operated on his liver. And after they did that, he was healthy. All I'm trying to say is God is meticulous. And so what God does is what he needs to do to get you where you need to be. God says it doesn't matter where you are or what you're going through. I got all the details worked out. God is meticulous first. God is meticulous in the moment. Would you say that in the moment? God is meticulous in the moment. God is meticulous in the moment, which is God knows the time, the season, the minute, the hour, and the second. And God orchestrates all things out for it. Check it out. God told Moses to stretch out his rod. And when he stretched out his rod, then the, 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 the waves open up. But after the waves open up, they had to stay there for a whole night. I can hear some people grumbling in the back. Why are we standing here? Don't you see that red sea open? Man, I don't know why we're standing here. I don't know what Moses is doing. I don't know. You want to go? Nah, we better not go. They were wondering what's going on. But the Bible goes on to say, in verse 21, the Bible goes on to say that what God was doing is God took the east wind, the east wind, well, where the temperature would have been hottest and hotter, and he took a mighty wind and he dried the seashore. God knew you need to wait right here while I work this out right here. Because God did not want them to have to travel through the mud. God said, I am so meticulous. Not only am I sending you through the sea, but I'm sending you through the sea on dry land. So they walked through the sea and their shoes did not get muddy. God is so meticulous. God is meticulous in the moment. But look, God wasn't only meticulous in the moment. Y'all need to get that. In every moment of your life, God has it orchestrated in design. Okay, okay. My father likes to do thousand-piece puzzles. He likes to do thousand-piece puzzles. And I remember he was talking, we were talking about a puzzle that was missing a piece. He said, I don't understand how I'm missing this piece. But then he said to me, but I know I've lost the piece because, son, when they make the thousand-piece puzzle, it is not a puzzle. It is a picture. Well, can I tell you, when you're dealing with the pieces of your life, it is a puzzle. But to God, it is a picture. He sees your life not, not, not horizontally, but he sees your life vertically. So he sees just right now, God sees the day you were conceived, the day you were born, the day you went to first, second, third, fifth, fourth grade, the day you went to high school and wherever else you went, as well as the day you got married or the day you bought your car, as well as the day you'll be home with him all at the same time. God does not see like you see walking through the moment. God sees it all there. And so God can move any piece or any part the way it needs to be moved. God sees your life not as a puzzle, but he sees your life as a picture. So he meticulously moves everything he needs to move the way he needs to move. Not only is God meticulous in the moment, but God was meticulous in Moses. You remember Moses' life story? You remember how he was raised in Pharaoh's house? But you remember he did not stay in Pharaoh's house because Moses murdered a man. And when he murdered a man, what did he do? He fled into the desert. Well, why did he flee into the desert? Because God knew, he said, Moses, I'm going to need you to lead some folk through the desert. So you need to know the dangers of the desert, the opportunities in the desert, where to go and what to do in the desert. So I'm training you in the desert. God had him made ready for the desert. All I'm trying to say is in your life, God has positioned people who have been made ready for everything you need to go through. God says, I'm putting somebody around you. I'm putting somebody behind you. I'm putting somebody in front of you who will help you get to where you need to go. I, I am meticulous in every circumstance and situation. God will send the one doctor who's not supposed to be in your room there. He'll send the one doctor who's supposed to be checking on your foot and they'll check on your liver. He'll send the one doctor who's supposed to be checking on your chiropractic needs and they'll say something's wrong with your heart. God is so meticulous. He knows what you need, when you need it, and he sends 
the right person. God is meticulous. God does not do just to do, but he knows exactly what he's doing. 14 years ago, I felt led to go to the bookstore. I felt led to go to the bookstore and, and just browse in Barnes & Noble. 14 years ago, I felt led to go to the bookstore. I was browsing in Barnes & Noble, and I saw a fine, beautiful brown sister. Yeah, it's no accident, it's no incident, but we've been married ever since because God is meticulous. There are no accidents in your life. Stop talking about accidents and incidents and mess ups. Even the stuff that felt jacked up was God setting you up to bless you. God is meticulous. Even the people who came in your life and hurt you, God allowed them to come through your life so he could build you up, so he could make you strong, so he could teach you what you ought to know. There's nothing in your life that God has not orchestrated. God is in super control. By the time I tell you about Jonah, we're studying Jonah, Jonah in Bible study, and it's so interesting that God prepared a big fish. And that the big fish not only had a stomach, but had a womb. You know, there's a difference between a stomach and a womb. I don't have a womb. Uh, my wife, women have wombs. The, the, the difference between a stomach and a womb is one is made for digestion and breaking things down, and the other is made for nutrition and building things up. God put Jonah not in a place of punishment, but in a place of safety and salvation. All I'm trying to say is God is absolutely meticulous. There is no accident in God. Everything that happened, God meant for it to happen. I, I got to move on. I, I told you, I told you about my father and, and this large television entertainment system and record player. Well, I was nostalgically excited to see that LPs or records are back in style. And, and what they say is, now they don't repair old records, they just make them new. And when they make the record new, the new record sounds better than the old record. That, that God doesn't just turn the record over, but he says, look, I know your life was dropped and broken. I know the scratch was deep and it hurt. But look, I can make it over. I know I'm in the Bible because after chapter 14 is chapter 15 of our text. And chapter 15, God says that Moses made music. God said that Moses made melody. God says that Moses began to sing what God has done. He said, look what God has done, how God has blessed us, how God has protected us, how God has gone before us, how God has been around us. Oh, look what God has done. And I've come by to tell somebody, I'm not talking about the music that you're going to hear in your ears, but I'm talking about the music of faith that you ought to hear in your heart. That God told me to tell you, I can hear music. I don't know what your life has been marred by. I don't know how your life has been messed up. But look, I hear music. I hear music in the air. And it's music that's saying that, that your life is going to be better. It's music that's saying that God has something up his sleeve. It's music that's saying that God is doing a new work and a new thing. It's music that's saying I has not seen and ear has not heard nor has it entered into the... It's music that's saying the best is yet to come. I hear music all around. In fact, I feel like that. I feel like dancing when I think about the music that I hear. It's not Marvin Gaye, it's not Beyonce, but it's music, but it's melodies, it's from heaven, and it's telling me that God is good, that God is worthy. It's telling me that God is still on the throne, and God is still in charge, and God is still good. It's telling me that God is on the move, and he's moving in your circumstance, and he's moving in your situation, and he's moving in your life. It's telling Telling me that God is so good, you can't imagine, you can't estimate, you can't guess, you don't know what God has for you. But I hear something, and I'm excited about it. Makes me want to dance, make me want to move, make me want to get down because God is good. Oh yes, oh yes. You ought to tell your neighbor, I hear music. I hear music. I've got faith.